All right, everybody pay attention to what's going on over here. I'll, what I'll need to do is I'll need to YouTube this one so OJ can uh, watch it because this one's fairly OJ's important. like really, really sick. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just have a, no excuse. He should be here anyway. So. All right. So uh, you're gonna. What I'm trying to get you to do is this is a little little dab of a rundown on the brain of an automatic transmission. And when I say brain, I mean this is where the uh, you know the fluid's channeled. And uh, you know obviously your uh, clutches and your holding devices and all are are what uh, are going to be fed fluid pressure so that your transmission various parts of the planetary gear sets will be held and driven so that you'll have your various different gears. Uh, but this is what a valve body looks like, and you guys are going to be tearing a valve body down and you know putting it back together and all that kind of thing. So uh, this, uh, you see, there's not all that many parts. You know, there's only as many parts as you see right there. Uh, you've got to keep your springs and all in order and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like if you look at a map of it. Now, this is overdrive range in first gear. Now, I want you to pay attention to the manual valve. The manual valve is the valve that's connected to your Pringle stick. You click, 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 click. You move that Pringle, you move your PRNDL, see that? See how you get your little, uh, your little park reverse neutral drive, drive two, drive one. This is a 4260E, like you got the old mobile out there. Uh, and so basically you got accumulators here. Accumulators are basically like little cushions that soften the application of a, of a, a clutch. So whenever, now you remember, uh, whenever you were driving yesterday and ever he had forgotten to plug the output shaft sensor in on the, uh, Tahoe, we were driving, and because it didn't have any vehicle speed, it knew the vehicle was moving, but it had no vehicle speed um, signal. And so what it did was it, it jerked a crick uh, in our neck, boom, whenever it, you know, because the, the pressure went really high. Because it raises the pressure really high, so it'll apply the clutches really hard, so it won't slip them and burn them out. So basically, if you've got a really harsh, you know, apply, I guess it's just scary, but uh, but anyway. Uh, so what's, see where the fluid's going? I mean, you need to memorize this because you're going to have to color in all these lines and draw this on your final exam. Okay, now this right here is overdrive in second gear. Did you notice what changed? Look at what changed between first and second. See how different passages yes. got fluid and all that? You're, you haven't moved, your, you hadn't moved this, but basically you've gone up and you've, now how does the transmission know that the vehicle is moving? And how does it know how fast it's moving? Huh? There's a speed sensor, but before that, there was a governor. And the governor was basically connected to the output so that it would spin faster and faster as the vehicle went faster. And it had a little fly weights on it, used centrifugal force usually. And they were riding against a spring, and the faster it moved, the more it moved. And governor pressure and line pressure do this. And so basically, whenever you're, uh, you know, or throttle valve pressure, I'm sorry, throttle valve pressure and, line and governor pressure do that. So the faster you go, uh, you know, the more it wants to shift into those next gears. But if you're applying a throttle heavier, like you're going up a hill, you want it to hold the gear longer, don't you? You want it to shift out as quick as you need the power. So they push against each other. And eventually the governor will override that. That's if it's got a old hydraulic governor and all that. But anyway, so notice you got a servo right here. And whenever this actually servo is hooked to one of those, you know, bands that goes around a drum and all that. There's your wall pump. There's your torque converter. See that? And so your oil pump and your torque converter, even though they're right next to each other in real life, we're going there's a cooler check valve right there. If you don't have a cooler check valve in there, what happens is when you park the darn thing, all of the oil siphons out of the torque converter into the, you know, back into the transmission oil pan, you it's morning sickness. You crank it up and it goes ooh, 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 like that. But it's going to fill up the torque converter. You got no fluid in the torque converter, you ain't pulling nothing. All right, so we'll go on. You see what happened here? See how these accumulators got squeezed? Whenever it was going to go out and fly those clutches, I'm not going to go into this real deep, but look what it is. See that accumulator? Mm -hmm. See that that one there? All right, let me go. Let me back up. Like that. See what? Watch what's going on in there. See? See how it's moving? It's, it's the, those valves in that bo valve body are redirecting fluid as the pressure changes and moves them around back and forth. Uh, the modulator valve, and this is something you need to know about too, the modulator valve is basically hooked to engine vacuum because when you're deep into the engine with the throttle, you are uh, got low vacuum. And when you got low vacuum, it's high load. So when it's high load, uh, that modulator is going to operate its full circuit so that it's going to cause it to hold the gears. That's like the throttle valve, all the ones that have a throttle valve. Now, you typically won't have a throttle valve on a modulator, although some of them would have a little kick down cable that would drop it into the next gear. 
So you see that these accumulators have all got their own thing. Now, let's go into a problem here. Get a grip on what the symptom is before you ever start working on it. Check the fluid, look for obvious problems, damage, leaks, whatever, and check for diagnostic trouble codes. Start there. Nothing wrong with that. 2002 Tacoma, intermittent, no reverse, takes off in second gear, no shift to fourth gear. Intermittently stores code PO755 for shift source S2 solenoid performance. Code was recorded, then cleared, and did not return even when reverse and second gear uh, start, no fourth gear problem occurred in a row test. So basically, you want to reduplicate a problem, it didn't reset the code. Okay, so from Toyota on this transmission, if you read that, look at all these words. La 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 la. You know, translation shifted that was totally handled hydraulically in bygone years is now handled electronically. Used to be a governor, now it's a speed sensor. And basically, the pressure, there's a pressure control valve typically that's going to control and have your pressure, you know, drive your pressure up and down. Is, you know, but on this particular one, let's talk about this. Gear shift operation during driving. The PCM receives input from the transmission range sensor, throttle position sensor, engine load information, along with the vehicle speed sensor, and uses solenoid activity to control the transmission shifts. That's not complicated, is it? You going to remember this? You remember it? Are your ears cold? Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, I'm thank you. All right. Shifting into first gear. Watch what happens when it shifts to first gear. Uh, basically, what this is trying to tell you is it energizes that solenoid. Right? This is the Toyota verbiage right here. So the engineers like to really put a lot of words up there. You know? And what I'm going to tell you is uh, that solenoid is, uh, actually, I've got these numbers wrong, I think. This should go, this should be S1, that should be S2. I got those numbers wrong the way I drew it, but don't worry about that. Solenoid 1 is energized. They engage first gear. B plus. Notice it's hardwired to ground. B plus comes out there, energizes solenoid one, causes the valve body to apply fluid pressure to the clutch and engages first gear. So that's your inputs out here, right? For second gear, solenoids one and two are energized on this particular one. At the same time, you know, obviously you got ground here, you got power here. All right, for third gear, solenoid two, now you've switched and now you've got only solenoid two energized for third gear. When you go to fourth gear, you got nothing. No solenoids energized, okay? You understand what I'm saying here now? Now, what, if, you're, if you think the way I do, I'm a sequential kind of a thinker. I like to do stuff in a certain order. And I'm going to have the idea that if when it shifts to first gear, your shift solenoid one's going to energize. When it shifts to second, so second gear, you know, shift solenoid two's going to energize. And when it shifts to third, shift solenoid three's going to energize. That ain't the way it works. They're all over the place. They may have this one on, that one off, this one on, that one all of them off, this one on, two on, whatever it is in fourth gear. So just get away from the notion that it's going to be one, two, three, one, two, three. You know? I mean, I don't know who came up with that notion, but there it is. All right, let's go back and look at what we have. No reverse, takes off in second gear, no shift to fourth gear, throws towards PO 755 for a shift to solenoid performance. Pop the solenoid on there, that's what that looks like. It was replaced, notice that the pan was clean. While it's off, see what's in the transmission oil pan. It's got a bunch of crud and metal filings on your little magnet in there, and you got a bunch of, and you got pieces of, crud laying in the pan, you know that stuff's coming apart in there and you're going to go a little deeper, you know, especially if it's got a lot of metal in the pan, you know, occasionally these splines that go in the torque converter may strip out. If you got one that's pulling too hard and all, you may have to put a torque converter on it or something. But if it does that, you need to put the cooler, uh, you know, replace the radiator because the transmission cooler is in the radiator on most of them or the transmission cooler if it's a standalone or if you don't want to put a radiator on it, put an external transmission cooler on it, but do not uh, put a, you know, rebuild or replace the transmission without considering the fact that all of the metal that came out of the wiped out gears went into the cooler. And it's going to get flushed right back out and it's going to get past the filter into the valve body and your valves are going to stick and it's going to take off the high gear and all kinds of crap you don't want to have to deal with. So make sure you remember you got to flush those cooler lines, get the metal out of those, and make filters to put on them. Flush those things out really good. Either replace the transmission cooler or the radiator. Make sure you get all that junk out of there if you're replacing the transmission. Just you know, wear out like that. All right, moving on. Road tested. Still had intermittent no reverse starting off in second gear, absence of fourth gear, not fixed. Complete valve body assembly with different OE solenoids was also tried. That didn't touch it either. They sound like, kind of like this beating them up. Really? All right. Okay, let's do a voltage check here. At aisle and part neutral drive in reverse, the S1 solenoid always showed 12 volts, and the S2 solenoid always showed 0 volts. Okay, so what does it mean when it shows zero volts? Okay, when it's showing zero volts, 
that means that the ECU has energized that solar. I mean, I'm sorry, not energized that solar. Well, this one here is supposed to be sitting voltage out there. See that? Well, if it's got 12 volts here, that means that it's a speed and current to that solar. If it's got zero volts there, there's no current flow to the solar, and the solar's not going to be working. So I check the voltage on the wires, that's one that has two address how to scan that and proper shift solar command. So we're watching it while it was shifting. When a problem occurred, there was two volts showing on S2 solar, uh, S2 solar light ring wire. Right, right, they were showing point, they showing two volts. What the heck is that all about? That didn't make any sense, did it? At the test, the S2 wire was cut. So they cut the wire, and that caused reverse to engage immediately and should have allowed for a first gear takeoff. Okay? So you have, they're, having, they're having to scratch and figure this out because it's not making any sense and the book's not helping them. So they're having to actually get in here and do some critical thinking. You know what I mean? They can't be low energy. They gotta be jumping into this. Right? All right, thinking there was a short power somewhere in the circuit, they ran an overlay. That means they went from here to here with a, with a new wire to see if it was going to be a problem in here anywhere. Uh, and unfortunately, the same problem remained. Two volt phantom showing up again. It was determined a computer must have a bad driver, so the shop bit the bullet and bought a new engine controller. It still ain't fixed. This is getting ridiculous, isn't it? We've still got the same problem. So what do they do? They give up and say, we can't fix it and send it on your way? That ain't how that works, is it? No. What about it? What you gonna do now? Think a little harder. Huh? Think a little harder. Yeah, you're gonna have to figure out something. It turned out, and nothing else to do but we check all around. In doing so, a loose bolt, so you're in a gang of grounds, was discovered in the engine department about front end grade. A loose ground? That's all it was? Yeah, this is this a transmission problem? Think about it. When the customer was quizzed, he says, oh yeah, the problem did show up after, after I had some engine work done. Why didn't he lead with that? <laughs> they won't tell you stuff sometimes. We have to figure it out, it would work. Might have saved ourselves a lot of time and money if that little bit of information was made available to begin with. All right, diesel died. Hunting in and out of fourth gear while driving at highway speeds. All right. Here's a little quick story there. Uh, this, uh, when I was working over there at the uh, dealership, um, we had the Jeep franchise, because we also had the you know, Mopar diagnostic system and the capability, you know, the RB3 and the way to program all of them. But anyway, they says, uh, this guy's willing to buy this truck, but he said it hunts in and out of gear, going down, or out of fourth gear going down the road, and he's not going to buy it if we can't fix that. And so we were swamped on, back there in the service department, so they shot it over to a, a transmission shop, a transmission shop, and that's a diesel Dodge, you remember it's a diesel, but it's got electronic transmission. He said, put a throttle position sensor on it, see what that does, if that doesn't fix it, we'll have to tear the transmission apart. And so they brought it to me, and I pulled up a technical service bulletin, and it said, if you've got a Dodge truck like this hunting in and out of fourth gear, go ahead and reflash the engine controller with this particular calibration. So I did, and fixed it that way. Mm -hmm, like that. Uh, they bought me a steak dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, it was through in 30 minutes, you know, and the guy bought the truck, and they were all happy, and everybody, you know, a good time was in my all. Now, this one right here was totally screwed up shifting. This one wasn't doing anything. <coughs> and uh, Kevin tore the thing apart and rebuilt it and messed with it and got his, you know, just got himself all screwed up in the head trying to figure out what was wrong with this thing. Nothing wrong with it on the inside. And uh, so what I did was I built him a little box so that we could tie in each one of the solenoid wires, and it would light up the you know, the, the little LEDs on the box as the solenoids were energized by the engine controller. And they actually had to build a tool to do that, we had on that one. And so, because they're what, they made a tool like that for the Ford Probe, and that was a Ford EAT transmission, but we didn't have a tool that would work on the Escort. So I went ahead and hooked up the uh, this little box of mine, and we went driving it down the road, and the, so the engine controller was screwed up and wouldn't operate the solenoid, right? So we put an engine controller on that one and fixed that one. And, uh, Here's another one. Now, this same guy, he did a transmission overhaul on a uh, four-wheel drive F-150 because it would shift into its gears too soon. Well, it was in high gear by the time you got going 15 miles an hour every time. And nothing he could do would fix it. He rebuilt the transmission and all that kind of stuff. He already beat himself up. And so, uh, they, you know, they finally they called for the calf rope. And I don't have all the answers, but sometimes I can, you know, fresh it, pair of eyes, you know, over it. And uh, I got a notice in when I got in there that some of the warning lights on the dash didn't work. And I said, did you notice some of these warning lights didn't work? He said, what's that got to do with anything? I said, well, how does it know it's in four-wheel low? Uh, I don't know. 
let's research that. So we researched it, and uh, if it sees 12 volts coming through that four-wheel low bulb, and it's not energized, uh, then it'll, it'll, it'll assume that it's in the high gear and it'll shift out later. But if the engine controller sees that there's no voltage coming through that four-wheel low bulb on the dash, then it puts it in four-wheel low shift strategy mode. <laughs> and so we put a fuse in there and got the lights working again, and it was all he needed was a fuse to fix that little problem. See what I'm saying? So, I mean, a lot of times just thinking outside the box is what you've got to do. I'm telling you, it takes a special kind of person to do transmission work. You know, people are more prone to cry and walk away working on the transmission than everybody's been in the general. All right, the importance of solenoids. Okay, so we go. Anytime you see a 700 series code right here, you might notice over that little thing, a little legend right here, 700 series codes are typically transmission codes. Some of you all already seen those codes when you pull the code. I think you pull some up, somebody pulled some on a vehicle with, uh, yesterday. Uh, if the check engine light does no more, but you're experiencing shifter problems, it might be an electrical or mechanical problem, some kind of related to the solenoids. This is more like spoken on solenoid. Pressure and everything. Every automatic transmission has some kind of pressure control, whether it be mechanical, like in a modulator or a throttle valve cable, or electromagnetic. Chrysler had throttle cable, throttle valve, Chrysler never had a modulator valve. They always went with the throttle valve. The deeper you are in the throttle, the higher the pressure goes, the later it shifts. That's what that's about. Most transmissions will default to high pressure when a problem is detected, but that's the safest thing to do. The clutches apply harder, and that doesn't hurt anything. It scares the daylight out of you, jerks your creek in your neck, but it don't hurt them. It prevents them from slipping unless they're already burned out. Okay? These little landing, these little clutches don't have much landing. They don't take very much to burn, burn them out. So you, you don't want them softly applying. Now, this little throttle cable, I'll tell you what really happened. You get in trouble, you think this little thing right here is not a big deal. That's the throttle valve cable on some of these vehicles. Whenever you operate the throttle, it pulls that out and it raises the pressure in the transmission. You leave that thing unhooked, you burn the transmission up. Make sure those cables are hooked up. Double check everything. Don't leave anything undone. And I have seen people, well, Ford for a while had a little uh, plastic bushing thing that was holding that to the throttle. And then that little thing would come out of there and it would people would be going into the throttle real deep, but the pressure would stay low and it would burn them up. And you had to rebuild the transmission or put one in. And so they actually put out a, a program on that. We had to put a little bronze bushing and a little uh, hairpin clip in there. But any cable is extended as the throttle is applied is typically a transmission throttle valve cable. In other words, if you're operating the throttle and you're seeing that it's pulling a cable while you're operating the throttle, that's typically your throttle valve cable for your transmission. See the importance of that. Domestic transmission solenoids are typically ground actuated. Asian transmission solenoids are positive side switched, like the one we looked at earlier. That means the hardware is out of the solenoid on domestic transmissions is always hot, and the PCM grounds the solenoid to make it work. Asian transmissions are hardware on the ground, and the PCM applies power to make them work. That's Nissan, that's Toyota, you know, and, or the 4EAT, which was Japanese in, the, in that escort. All right, so planetary gear, this is a reminder, provides a various gear ratio depending on what's held and what's driven. And you know, there's your planetary gear set, you know, you got your sun gear, you got your ring gear, and there's your reaction internal gear. And uh, that's this, what's these big old fat teeth around this one for, you know? Anybody know what that's for? That's where the park, that's park. You got a park pole that locks in there. When you didn't park, you know how sometimes you'll put it in park and it'll roll a little bit and go thunk. That's because it's sitting on top of one of those teeth and it rolls and drops down between there. Okay? Now there you notice those are really strong teeth too, you know, they're gonna break off in a little easy. Alright, some transmissions have all their solenoids in a single pack. And this one here is for a Dodge Stratus. They don't cost all that much. You get codes for a shift solenoids and a Dodge Stratus, and the wires are okay, you're gonna be popping a set of shift solenoids on there. Change them flat footed, standing in front of the car. They're right there. You gotta pay attention to your gasket and stuff, make sure you put it on there, right? But a lot of these times they'll come with a kit. These two speed sensors and that gasket uh, come with that thing, and there's your filter kit, the filter. Uh, so you, you do all that, you're giving yourself a transmission tune up on one of these, uh, you know, front wheel drive Dodge, like Dodge Caravan, Dodge Stratus, these kind of things like that. And, uh, you know, we fix some of them by replacing that solenoid on it. And uh, E40D, 4100, the solenoid pack is in the pan, and this right here sticks up through the case, and you plug them wires into it like that. And so your solenoids, typically, a lot of them come in just one big assembly, and it also has a transmission oil temperature sensor in it. Um, 
And this one right here, the 4L60E, the internal solenoids in that, you know, they're kind of separate. Ford Tauruses are like that too. You got three solenoids and pressure control solenoid. Uh, you know, it's like three hundred dollars worth of solenoids. Here's something else too. If you're, you can rebuild everything on like a Ford Taurus. If you're, if you're going into a Ford Taurus, you even have to go ahead and replace all the clutches and seals anyway. Uh, and you know, the valve body cleans up really good. Go ahead and throw a set of solenoids on there too, because the solenoids can look good, test good, but not work right. You run into that before trying to save money. And you cost yourself a lot of work trying to save money because you've got to pull the transmission back out to you and go drag. You know what I mean? So anyway, uh, just keep it in mind that if you're going that deep into the transmission, you may as well replace the only way too. This one right here comes with a little thing like that. Now the transmission controller on some of these late model Fords is actually built into a harness vaguely similar to that that goes on the throttle body. We had to uh, fix one of those too. That's another story. 4L60E wiring looks like this when you look at your solenoids. If you got an issue where your solenoids, where none of them are powered up, you got a whole bunch of uh, codes for transmission solenoids, I'm going to be looking at a fuse. Look at that. 10 out fuse feeds those. Engine controller operates. See how easy it is to lose every solenoid in the transmission because you blew one fuse? So if you're seeing a whole bunch of codes for transmission solenoids, find out what fuse feeds them and go check that. Let's do what's quick and easy. You know, don't, don't make it harder than it is. Has anybody in ever done that? You ever make it harder than it was? You, you ever do that? Make the job harder than it was? You ever kick yourself for saying, why did I do all that work? Uh, Honda Odyssey transmission, external solenoids. You know, they actually go out here. Here's something else you got to pay attention to as well. On a Honda Odyssey, see the brown, see the black? Mm -hmm. You don't want to plug those in backwards, match up. Match them up. I've actually seen where uh, transmission was rebuilt, wasn't working right, because they put the solenoids, and not all the solenoids are made together, I guess. Some of them you put them in there separately. They put them in there backwards, in the wrong place. So when the wires were plugged in to match the colors, the transmission wouldn't work right. And we actually found an illustration of where those were supposed to be in the Honda part of the shop manual. And when we swapped the solenoids around, plugged them in right, took care of it. Once again, go back and double check everything. It's also very easy to, to get fall into the trap of uh, when you're putting the transmission back in, you're having to completely fill it with fluid, not putting enough fluid in it. Make darn sure it's full. But you'll think it's full when it's not. You know how sometimes you pull a dipstick out and it's wet all the way up here, then you flip it on the other side and it's wet down there? Look at the side that's not wet all the way up. That'll be your accurate reading. And remember, transmission fluid expands when it gets warm. And so it's going to come up the stick about a half a quarter, so sometimes a little more. Um, all right, look at all this right here. Your solenoids can be numerous and complicated, you know, like on a 2008 F-250 diesel. Look at all the solenoids. Bam, 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 bam. You got lots of solenoids. This is basically telling you what the spec is that each one of the supposed to read. Pressure control solenoid is basically one that has the more current you apply and the more it must. And if you pull your, what are you supposed to have if you killed your power to your solenoids and your pressure control solenoids is going to default? Is it going to default to high pressure or low pressure? High pressure because that's a safe default. That's like a defrost in your car is what all that blows. If something goes wrong with all that crap under the dash, it defaults to defrost so that you can keep your windows clear so you can see and not crash your burden. All right, Ford Focus. Look at all those. Now I'm going to uh, point you in this direction. You're going to start looking at this. This shift solenoid apply chart, if you can find it, is one of your best friends. There's also clutch and band apply charts and all that. So get used to this. The person that wants to be a transmission mechanic can't just wing it. There's too much you have to understand in the way of electronics, hydraulics, mechanical principles. You yeah, chart. Whenever you're in these various different gears and you're uh, basically shifted up, see, it's going to tell you what it is that it's going, what these solenoids are doing. And you've got to be able to uh, work with that. Now, I've actually got some worksheets I've already given you on that. What are you smiling about? Did you, you make fun of me? What? All right. Uh, there's your solenoid flat chart. See, the EPC control depends on the throttle position vehicle speed. You go deeper into it, what's your EPC going to do? What's the pressure going to do when you go deeper into it? Well, higher. That's right. When you come out of it, it's not. Now, you can go to that GMC, put a scan tool on it, and you can actually have a pressure gauge on the GMC, and you can tell it to operate that pressure control solenoid and make the pressure go up. And there's a worksheet on that. You know, so I was telling her, she's not as far behind on automatic transmission worksheets as she thinks she is, because you guys have been dragging your feet. All right. Now then.
It's right here, mechanical operation of grainy drift. Look at that. Part, shift solenoid A ohm, shift solenoid B ohm. All right, when you put it in reverse, this applies. Reverse clutch applies, obviously, and both solenoids are ohm. Knowing this is important. Knowing how to read this is important. Drive first, ohm. Forward clutch is applied, forward sprag is holding. The sprag is the one that goes one way and doesn't go the other. You know, kind of like the stator in the middle of the, uh, it's got a one-way clutch in the middle of that stator, the torque converter I showed you. All right. So, see how that? Get used to these charts right here. Here's the deal. Let's say you've got a problem in one particular gear. All right. Let's say that I've got a problem in, um, well, I'll just make it real easy. What, let's say I've got everything except reverse. What's, my, what's the most likely cause of my problem? I'm going to say this. The reverse clutch is probably going to be a problem. Right? All right. Now, you can actually do the math on this. Uh, let's say that you've got a problem in second. Third. See, what's applied in that particular gear and range? If you look and see what's applied when you tear the transmission down, if you know which one is which, you can look for a problem in that specific area. Make sure you have a split piston or something like that. Um, all right. And these right here, see, that when they're on the same chart, some manufacturers will go out of their way in a big way to help. Others will practically throw you under the bus. Transmission gurus have apps you can download on your smartphone. You can download apps on your smartphone to help you with transmission stuff. And see this? Range reference chart. This is basically telling you about your solenoids, your bands, your clutches, you know, all the roller clutches, the whole shooting match, all on one chart. And it's giving you, and it even tells you where they are in the transmission. If you were tearing that down, you'd know right where to go, wouldn't you? End of the show. Yep. Anybody get anything out of that at all, or are you all sitting there about to go to sleep? Uh, I got a lot out of it. Huh? I got a lot. It's going to help me pop, with my electrode now. Pop test. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, see that? Okay, see the do it deer in the headlights? You know, it's the big eyes. Hmm. I'm awful at this, but we all know this. Yeah, tests are good. They're our friends. They're not good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Electrode's good too. It is also our friend. I started on Electrode. I need to reset some stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. She's having trouble. Hey, by the way, she's having some issues with the math part of the Pascal's Law stuff. And, uh, you know what Linda did like the Pascal, the news and all that stuff? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, did yeah. you do that? Yes, I'm having trouble with that. Can you that one question? <laughs> did you do it? It gave me the formula to do it. The pressure equals whatever. But apparently, yeah. I don't know. It doesn't tell you how to do it. What I, what I want you all to do is give her a hand with that so you can put your heads together. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, I did everything. Yeah. I was like... Well, Nicholas, when he was here, he could blow through that stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? He was just a, he was a math head, you know, and all that. And, uh, but anyway, uh, y'all give her a hand with that stuff. And uh, Noah, you get past that stuff? Yeah, you get past that stuff? Yeah. yeah, I got it. Yeah, Noah's a machine. All right. Okay. All right. Well, that's the end of that story. And, uh, and, uh,